If you want to practice all of the new PTE questions using artificial intelligence on an online portal that has a similar marking to your real PTE exam, head over to masterpte.com.au to create a free account. Here, you can practice all four sections separately and receive instant feedback for all of your speaking, writing, reading, and listening. You can also view and compare your answers with others who have already succeeded in achieving a high score. Download 9090 Band's template for speaking, writing, and listening. Take mock test, receive instant result, overall feedback, and in-depth analysis which helps you pinpoint exactly where you lose points. MasterPTE.com.au the best PTE practice software in the world. The city of Rome is very special. The city grew in a fairly ad hoc way, as I mentioned. It wasn't planned all at once. It just grew up over time, beginning in the 8th century BC. Now this is interesting because what we know about the Romans is when they were left to own devices and they could build the city from scratch, they didn't let it grow in an ad hoc way. They structure it in a very methodical way. That was basically based on military strategy and military planning. The Romans couldn't have conquered the world without obviously having a masterful military enterprise and everywhere they went on their various military campaigns. They would build camps and those camps were always laid out in a very geometric plan along a grid, usually square or rectangular. So, when we begin to see the Romans building their ideal Roman city, they turn to that so-called castrum or military camp design.
Now, as we all know, it has long been the habit in many countries that teachers give homework to school children of all ages. Despite the fact that a minority of educators don't agree with this practice, it has never seriously been questioned or challenged before. However, it may be that the tide is turning. These days, more people are becoming convinced that homework is of virtually no benefit, particularly for children in the younger age group. So, why have teachers always given homework? Well, the answer seems to be because they are obliged to. Most teachers don't really believe it has any real value, and the latest research supports the teachers' feelings about this. Not only does homework have very little impact on children's learning, but it also puts unnecessary obligations and responsibilities onto the parents. These days, not all families have the time or the necessary knowledge to help their offspring. So it would seem that now senior educators want to start a new initiative. Rather than giving homework, they plan to encourage reading books of any kind, just reading. And they claim that this is a far more effective method of consolidating learning than wading through piles of written homework.
Semantic noise in communication is a type of disturbance in the transmission of a message, that could interfere with the interpretation of the message due to ambiguity in words, sentences or symbols used in the transmission of the message. Let's take a step back for a moment to provide a larger framework that helps you understand the idea of semantic noise a bit easier. Communication is the process of transmitting information from one person to another. Information is a pattern of data organized in a particular way. For example, a sentence consists of symbols that form words in a particular language with a particular meaning. The sentence also utilizes grammar, which is a recognized way to structure words forming a sentence. Noise is any type of disturbance that interferes with the interpretation of the information. Some argue that noise exists in all communication. Semantic noise doesn't involve sound but rather ambiguity in words, sentences or other symbols used in communication. The ambiguity is caused because everybody sees a different meaning in the same words, phrases or sentences. The differences in interpretation can be quite small, even undetectable, in regular communication between people from the same culture, age, education and experience, or drastically different because of such things as culture, age or experience. Okay, 
To help you with your research, I just wanted to give you some tips today on using focus groups. These are groups of people that you get together to find out about their opinions and attitudes. For example, to review a piece of work or just basically provide some collective input to help you with whatever you're researching. First of all, how large should a focus group be? Well, I would say that an ideal number of participants is around six or seven. If it's any bigger, what quite often happens is they break into side conversations and the focus is lost. If it's any smaller, you may not get the range of views that you need to get a really good discussion. Secondly, it's important that you have a moderator for the group who's able to facilitate and guide the discussions. The moderator must ensure that everyone participates and stop anyone dominating. And also, the moderator needs to make sure that the discussions don't go off in the wrong direction. And thirdly, in order to help the group focus on what's required, some basic materials should be used, particularly to kick-start the discussions. This may be in the form of pictures, photos, diagrams, graphs, etc., and will help the group to understand the context of what needs to be discussed.
Crops can affect climate in two ways. A substantial amount of land surface is used for agricultural production, so the use of land affects the climate. If we deforest a land and plant crops instead, the characters of the land surface will be altered, which will ultimately change the original climate. This requires the cooperation between crop scientists and climate scientists and the integration of two different models. Now, as urban planners, what we really need to start considering is the amount of space allocated for residential areas within a city or town. And when I say space, I'm talking about space within a dwelling or home, rather than the actual size of residential areas. There's growing concern that the internal space of new homes is becoming far smaller, too small, in fact. Maybe you're thinking, is it important for residents to have sufficient space? Is it merely a preference to have more space, or are there more serious implications? Is there, in fact, any evidence to suggest cramped living conditions affect residents' physical or mental well-being or their day-to-day -day life? Well, research from a number of sources indicates that this is an important issue which needs addressing. Cramped conditions can lead to aggressive behaviour, to family tensions, psychological anguish and, in the more extreme cases, physical illness as well. Not only this, 
but there is a proven link between overcrowding and the social and emotional development of children, as well as their educational attainment. So, the main issue here is that residents require enough individual space to be able to live and function together, but with sufficient private space for personal time within the home. One of the keys to Apple is Apple's an incredibly collaborative company. And so, you know how many committees we have at Apple? No. Zero. We have no committees. No committees. We are, a ver we are organized like a startup. One person's in charge of iPhone OS software. One person's in charge of Mac hardware. One person's in charge of iPhone hardware engineering. Another person's in charge of worldwide marketing. Another person's in charge of operations. It's, we're organized like a startup. We're the biggest startup on the planet. And we all meet for three hours once a week, and we talk about everything we're doing, the whole business. And there's tremendous teamwork at the top of the company which filters down to tremendous teamwork throughout the company. And teamwork is dependent on trusting the other folks to come through with their part 
without watching them all the time, but trusting that they're going to come through with their parts. And that's what we do really well. And we're great at figuring out how to divide things up into these great teams that we have and all work on the same thing, touch bases frequently, and bring it all together into a product. We do that really well. And so what I do all day is meet with teams of people and work on ideas and solve problems to make new products, to make new marketing programs, whatever it is. And are people willing to tell you you're wrong? <laughs> yeah. I mean, other than snarky journalists. I mean, people that oh, work Oh, yeah. For no, we have wonderful arguments. And do you win them all? Or? Oh, no, I wish I did. <laughs> no, see, you can't. <laughs> if you want to hire great people and have them stay working for you, you have to let them make a lot of decisions, and you have to, you have to be run by ideas, not hierarchy. The best ideas have to win. So, Otherwise, good people don't stay. But you must be more than a facilitator who runs meetings. You obviously contribute your own ideas. I contribute ideas, sure. Well, I, why would I be there if I didn't? <laughs>
Some of them are very familiar from everyday life, some of them are not. So we all know about gravity, that's one of the four forces. It's what keeps us anchored to the surface of the Earth, keeps the Earth in orbit around the Sun. There's another force that we're all very familiar with, which is the electromagnetic force. That's the force that is responsible for electricity, electric currents, for light, for the Sun's light. That's the electromagnetic radiation coming from the Sun to the Earth. There are two other forces, though, that are somewhat less familiar, and they're the nuclear forces. They are forces that are at work within the nuclei of atoms. One of those forces is called the strong nuclear force. That really is a force that binds protons to protons, binds the quarks inside of the protons and neutrons, keeping them from flying out. The other nuclear force is called the weak nuclear force, and that's a force that predominantly we know of because it's responsible for radioactivity, radioactive decay. So those four forces, strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, electromagnetic force, and the gravitational force, those are the forces at work in the universe. A dimension of space is basically an independent direction in which, in principle, you could move, you could walk. So when we talk about left-right, you can freely move left-right. 
back forth, you can freely move back forth, and up down, you can freely move up down as well. If you consider a, a diagonal direction, that's not a new dimension because that's just a combination of moving this way and that way. So when we talk about dimensions, we're talking about the independent directions in which you can move. Another way of thinking about dimensions, they are the data that needs to be specified in order to delineate where something takes place. So if you're having a dinner party, you give your friend a street, a cross street, and a floor number. Three pieces of information to nail down a location in three dimensions of space. According to string theory, in reality, you need to give your friend more than just those three pieces of information. If you really want him or her to know where to go, you need to tell them coordinates, data that specifies where in the extra dimensions the dinner party is taking place too. But because the extra dimensions we think are so small, it doesn't matter to your friend whether they show up exactly at the right location, the extra dimensions or not, because things are not able to penetrate them in any meaningful way. But that's what a dimension would be. It's a piece of data necessary to delineate where something takes place. At the top, 
you would have a king. Now the king would rule over a kingdom. Now this is not so easy to govern, especially during the Middle Ages, and the king might owe many people things, especially people who helped the king come to power, helped him depose the previous king or to conquer this land. And so in exchange for that and to help govern, he might grant land or feasts to other people. And the key currency in the Middle Ages under the feudal system is land, and land in exchange for loyalty and service. So this whole thing is a kingdom. Now right over here, this is a duchy. And a duchy will be controlled by a duke. I guess they didn't call it ducky because that just doesn't sound as serious. So the king might grant a duchy, a duchy to a duke, and in exchange the duke would provide loyalty, pledge their fealty. If the kingdom is threatened, the duke will fight alongside the king, would provide their own troops. If the king wants to go conquer other territories, same thing. And also provide the king with taxes, which might be in the form of coinage, depending on what time and region we are in the Middle Ages. Or it might be in the form of a percentage of the agricultural production from this duchy.
If you want to practice all of the new PTE questions using artificial intelligence on an online portal that has a similar marking to your real PTE exam, head over to masterpte.com.au to create a free account. Here, you can practice all four sections separately and receive instant feedback for all of your speaking, writing, reading, and listening. You can also view and compare your answers with others who have already succeeded in achieving a high score. Download 9090 Bands template for speaking, writing, and listening. Take mock test, receive instant result, overall feedback, and in-depth analysis which helps you pinpoint exactly where you lose points. masterpte.com.au, the best PTE practice software in the world.